And then how does cardiogenic shock look? Well, most of the time it's going to look like this, where we have a decreased left ventricular ejection fraction. Depending on the etiology, if it's an acute MI or some other ischemia, we may see regional wall motion abnormalities like we see here. So here we see pretty good systolic thickening of the myocardium at the base of the heart, but the apex is very hypokinetic. And another thing to notice is the the mitral valve opens poorly, which is often a sign of poor left ventricular function. And the only way to get really good at assessing left ventricular ejection fraction is to look at a lot of hearts, see a lot of normals, and then when your normal is ingrained in your brain, the abnormal is really going to stand out. Just a few more examples of your kind of classic pump failure cardiogenic shock. So we just see dilated left ventricles, not a lot of change in shape during systole, we see poor opening of the mitral valve, also demonstrated here very well, not a lot of change in shape. So these are pretty obvious signs of left ventricular failure. If you see this in a patient in shock, then it's either a cardiogenic shock or they have shock with underlying cardiac disease, which is going to influence your management, or they have shock with some kind of secondary cardiodepressive effects, which sometimes happens. Either way, this is going to affect that three liters of fluid that your sepsis alerts tell you you want to give in your patients with shock. Just a few last examples again. We see a minimal change in area of the left ventricle. Here we see these are short axis examples where we see the area from diastole to systole just doesn't change very much. Here we've got some regional wall motion abnormalities. We have pretty good thickening of the myocardium here, but then just decreased function and decreased area change throughout the cardiac cycle. And again, we the left ventricular failure may be their etiology of shock, and maybe you have other clinical clues. Maybe they had chest pain, and maybe when you look at their lungs, you see pulmonary edema, which would increase the likelihood that this is acute cardiogenic shock. But don't forget, maybe they have underlying cardiac disease, and this is just a complicating factor in their shock. Or maybe they have septic shock with some cardiodepressive effects. So just because you see a poor functioning left ventricle, you have to incorporate into that whole clinical picture and what else you see when you do their ultrasound. And I always like to you know, try to throw people off with this one. So I say, look at this heart and tell me what's the physiologic category of shock. Well, you probably know, we've already alluded to this a little bit, that sometimes the heart may be vigorous in cases of mechanical cardiogenic shock. So don't let that fool you and don't cross that off your list until you've really thought it through and looked for other findings. Maybe a little less common, but certainly uh, relevant and important in our patients. So the mechanical etiologies of cardiogenic shock are things that cause acute regurgitation. So papillary rupture, which is going to lead to mitral regurgitation. Aortic dissection, which is going to lead to aortic regurgitation. Endocarditis, any valve that's affected. And then complications of acute MI, which may be an ischemic VSD, uh, left ventricular free wall rupture, and then again, papillary rupture, as previously mentioned. With these, there's a fair likelihood that we should see regional wall motion abnormalities as well. And we'll, we'll look a little bit at using color, but if you have a little bit of suspicion, throw color across the valve. And if you're kind of earlier in your stage of learning ultrasound, after you feel pretty good about getting your normal views, start just practicing putting color on the mitral and aortic valve and starting to get your eyes accustomed to what that normal color pattern looks like throughout the cardiac cycle. And as mentioned, the MI complications are typically accompanied by regional wall motion abnormalities. So here are some pretty obvious findings that even a less trained eye can identify. Here we see aortic regurgitation. Let's slow this down just a second and we'll kind of try to break down the cardiac cycle. So remember, if the mitral valve is open, then by definition we're in diastole. If during diastole we're seeing flow go from the aorta into the ventricle, and really there should never be flow from the aorta into the ventricle, then we know that's aortic regurgitation. It takes a little bit of practice to train your eye and kind of pick up the cardiac cycle and recognize the direction of flow, but sometimes it can be helpful to pause the picture and just follow. So we're in diastole and we see flow going from aorta into ventricle. Now we'll play that up again. And this is a pretty obvious example, relatively easy to follow. 
and we see it's very turbulent. That's hence all the different colors. In this example here, and let's, again, this one's pretty obvious, but let's kind of slow it down again. So what we see, so one, there should never be flow from the ventricle towards the left atrium. So that's, that's your clue. And if we keep our eyes on the valve, here it's open. So here we see the leaflets of the mitral valve, they're nice and open. So that's during diastole. And then as they're coming down and they're trying to close, so now we're in systole. During systole, now they're not closing very well, that's why they're so leaky, we have mitral regurgitation. And again, these are nice, fairly obvious examples. So practice, practice your eyes looking at those, and I definitely encourage you to look at some normal patients, apply color, to start to get a feel for what that looks like. And the diagnosis that haunts me in my sleep all the time and may cause acute shock due to either cardiogenic, mechanical cardiogenic shock, or could also cause tamponade, is aortic dissection. So here we see a dilated aortic root with this big flap here. We've also got a pleural effusion with fluid behind the descending aorta. And if we put color here, we'd probably see some aortic regurgitation. And over here, we again dilated aortic root. We see a subtle flap here, but we also see the flap in the descending aorta. So this patient, if we put color, they don't have to have aortic regurgitation, uh, but they may. Uh, this could certainly be an etiology of shock. And aortic dissection is, again, it's a tricky diagnosis because it can mimic so many things. It could cause cardiogenic shock due to aortic regurgitation, but it could also cause obstructive shock due to tamponade when it dissects into the pericardium. So here we see a uh, not very big, but a pericardial effusion in this patient with a dilated aortic root. And as we trace the aorta a little bit further, we see this large flap and this dilated aortic arch. And here's an example of one of the acute MI complications where we see papillary muscle rupture. And we can actually see this kind of flinging about papillary muscle, but we see a nice vigorous hyperdynamic left ventricle because it's trying to compensate for all this increased volume due to the acute mitral regurgitation. Just another example here, we see this kind of flail leaflet due to the ruptured papillary muscle. And this same patient where we can see the little leftovers of that papillary muscle flapping around, flapping about. And again, their left ventricle is pretty vigorous. You see this ejection fraction here is probably 70, 75%. We see that endocardium closing together and almost kissing during systole. But if you look at their lungs, they're gonna be in pulmonary edema. So this is mechanical cardiogenic shock. And in these cases, they have a vigorous looking left ventricle. And just a few more examples, not that common, not seen a million of these in my life, uh, but here's an, an example of an ischemic VSD. This patient's probably gonna have some pulmonary edema when you look at their lungs. And you can even see here, here at this apex and at the distal septum, there's some hypokinetic areas of this left ventricle. So ischemic VSD. And here's a subtle, not easy to recognize, but free wall left ventricular rupture and some hemopericardium. So that's gonna have associated, at least localized hemopericardium. Not gonna see these every day, but don't forget them and don't leave them off your differential. Just one last example here. This one was pretty obvious. This is a case from when I caught one of my colleagues. We can see the VSD here. And here we can see color with flow moving from left ventricle to right ventricle and even some fingers pointing it out, which just shows you the diagnostic acumen of some of our emergency physicians here at West Virginia University. And in just summary, and I, I like to cover this because one, it's easy to forget about because it's not as common. And using point of care ultrasound is a game changer as far as identifying these things and treating them appropriately whereas without, they might have been easy to miss or um, hard to recognize. So just a reminder, mechanical cardiogenic shock, usually they're gonna have either some sort of acute regurgitation from either like papillary rupture, endocarditis, or aortic dissection, or it could be an acute MI complication, which papillary rupture fits into that, or it could be an LV, free wall rupture, or an ischemic VSD. Not that common, but important to think about, and maybe you can make these diagnoses more quickly and directly if you're using point of care ultrasound, and if you work in some of the small places I work, finding these things quickly means an immediate transfer to a different center. And the sooner you make that decision, the better likelihood your patient's gonna make it alive. And this example here, we just see these horrible looking vegetations on this patient's mitral valve that has also left ventricular hypertrophy and um, endocarditis. And we're not gonna, this is not a specific endocarditis talk, but 
certainly uh, worth noting, especially in the IV drug-ravaged opioid epidemic of our country. And I alluded to this already, but what other things will you see with acute uh, left-sided regurgitation, so aortic or mitral? You're probably going to see sonographic beelines. So this is just another illustration of why we look at heart, lungs, abdomen, and we try to be systematic with the whole thing. So if we see things that we think are signs of cardiogenic shock, either from pump failure or mechanical causes, when we look at the lungs, we should see signs of pulmonary edema, which include sonographic beelines. And if you're these are kind of new or you're not familiar to you, then please go back and review my heart and lung point of care ultrasound CME courses.